everyone to the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival 2021. My name is Dania Wright. Thank you for joining us. This year, our full program will be screened online from September the 22nd to the 28th with our new media exhibitions available online as well. So feel free to comment and ask any questions you have for the filmmakers and we will try to answer them during the session. And of course, don't forget you can check out the films and at ttfilmfestival.com. You'll find all the information on how to buy your tickets there. We would also like to thank our TTFF sponsors and partners. NGC is our signature sponsor this year and we have leading sponsorship from Shell Trinidad and Tobago and Republic Bank Limited, as well as contributing and supporting sponsorship from NLCB and Sports and Culture Fund, respectively. So, all right. So today we have a bevy of filmmakers with us today. We have um, Vashni Korin with You Can't Stop Spirit. You have um, An Open Horizon by Baez. Um, I think that's your last name. Um, Wendy Nanan with An um, with Andil Gozin and Port of Spain as Writers Heaven by Janine Mendez Franco and Dion Boku. Welcome, filmmakers. So, um, so let's start with you, Vashni. Um, let's talk about the difference between Carnival and Mardi Gras in your film because you made a very specific distinction. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of um, to, to solidify what it was. Yeah, most definitely. So Carnival started back during Jim Crow, the Jim Crow era where Black people weren't able to participate in Mardi Gras in the regular parade. So what they did was they kind of broke away from Mardi Gras and created their own things in the neighborhoods of New Orleans. And um, through that spurred um, these beautiful traditions, such as the Bones and Skeletons game, the Baby Dolls, of course, and the Black Mardi Gras Indians. Do, do you know much about Trinidad's Carnival? Because those um, those those characters are are sort of similar to us. Um, and like I I went to New Orleans and I was very fascinated about how similar some of the the elements of Mardi Gras and Trinidad Carnival. So I'm interested to know how much you knew about that before doing the film. Yes, so interesting. I'm, first of all, I'm dying to come to Trinidad and um, experience Carnival there and just study the similarities and the differences. But I, I did know that baby dolls existed in Trinidad prior to doing the film, just, you know, conducting my research. Um, I studied under Dr. Kim Bosterville, um, who is the professor at Xavier University. And she, you know, kind of took me under her wing and I got introduced to the baby dolls and learned that they were in Trinidad too. So I'm, I'm curious if there was any, you know, when during the, the emergence of the baby dolls was there any communication between new orleans and trinidad like how did that come about so well I, I think they both have um a common uh colonizer so to speak um being the french and i think carnival originally comes from that background so i think that might be the unifying factor <laughs> definitely i'm sure there's even more details to to dive into so so your film spoke, focuses on um, women specifically and how they relate spiritually to um, to a, a character in Carnival. Why is that important? When you say character, you mean the baby doll. The baby dolls. How? Mm -hmm. Why is it important that they relate to baby yeah. dolls? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess. You know, back when the baby dolls first started, um, people were being called, um, I think the word baby came into popular lexicon, you know, when you call somebody a loved one baby or what have you. And so, yeah, it's it's actually interesting. They just kind of came out and um, dressed in short dresses and skirts and wore garters and carried switch knives. So they were kind of bucking the system in a way. They not only weren't supposed to participate in Mardi Gras, but they came dressing in a way that kind of um, challenged the social norm at the time. You know, we were in a time where women had to wear long dresses and, you know, you had to be proper. So they kind of used um, Carnival as a way to, to experience freedom on their own terms. 
Okay, Suki Med- Medawi. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> struggling with your name a little bit. Um, in Fire Lee, you also kind of um, explore. She also explores character through um, folklore when she takes on the Anigua, Anigua, which is something that we we have similarly in Trinidad under another name. It's you know for us it's called the Laja Bless, and there's a little bit of Dwen in there for us too. Um, so I I just wanted to talk to you about the importance of um, flipping the narrative of folklore on its head to create new meaning for women and and us occupying space. Absolutely. Well, I I actually grew up. It's it's called the Siguapa, and a lot of Fearley's work. When I first met, when I first connected with her, we connected over this um, shared, I would say, inherited narrative of both coming from occupied spaces. I grew up in Morocco, occupied by the French. And like also it's been sort of like a recent um, a recent space of freedom and yet not so much. And you feel it in the culture and the this desire to shed light on the way that mythology can help us move through our own psychological limitations and the psychological cagings that we often don't even know how to identify because they're so deeply ingrained. And so for her, she saw symbols like the Sigwapa um, and there's sort of this this character, this mythological wild woman caricature in all cultures, uh, seeing her as a kind of Trojan horse to get underneath the, um, the narratives that essentially control us. And so we talked a lot at the very beginning about, you know, the master's tools will never destroy the master's house and this sort of concept of how do we communicate um, in coded language that both invites people who may not understand their uh, participation in narratives that cage us um, and to invite people in to see this beautiful sort of foreign wild creature that is both sensual but also wild and untamable and what I really connected to was this notion that these metaphors help us connect to ourselves. They help us connect to a deeper aspect of ourselves. And no matter what language it's spoken in, no matter where the symbol has been rooted from geographically, we can, beyond language and culture, we can connect to that spirit inside of us, which is the untamed, uncaged, um, absolutely uh, unable to be taken. Uh, and I, I just, I very much connected with the aspect of her that lived that through her art and that every piece she made was a representation of that desire to be a trickster, to be both beguiling and not, not, rep- and, and sort of, uh, confusing where it's like you both are drawn in and also pushed away at the same time. So I, I was very inspired by the ways that those symbols and the Suguapa um, as this sort of wild woman that would, uh, you know, run away from men and, and tell them that I will not be trifled with, but her feet were backwards. And so they would get lost um, if anyone tried to chase her. It's sort of this, I think, a deeper narrative that all of us wish we could have <laughs> is the ability to be uncatchable, you know, um, and in some ways be, be, powerful beyond the forces that seek to control us um and that is something that i'm very inspired by through her work that's that's amazing um janine and dion you have a beautiful film an ode to Porta to being um with literature um and it's funny how all of your films kind of deal with new spaces and new cultures through the arts that we already have so architecture though i think is such art is such an indel makes an indelible mark on the people around it so let's talk about um what you're trying to convey in terms of port of spain and the psyche of the trinidadian people wow that sounds like a question for janine (laughs) 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 nice reflection there dion (laughs) Um, well, the architecture that we sort of featured in the, in the film was really dictated by the books. Um, you know, we started off at, you know, what is a really a national landmark, I think, which is the National Library, um, designed by the late Colin Laird. And from that sort of ground zero, if you wish, 
we span out uh, across the city and we visit places like the Red House and Woodford Square and the Lighthouse and then we make our way um, back to East Port of Spain where there was no piece of particular architecture per se. Um, then we meandered through Belmont, which focused on the bar that was the, the main setting in Barbara Jenkins's book, The Writer's Place. Um, from there, we went to the Botanic Gardens, which again was not architecture, but you know, carried us across the Queen's Park Savannah where we had the Magnificent Seven, which was a wonderful piece of the film, probably my favorite part of it. And then we ended up, actually we went to Nightfall House first, and then um, sort of took in the whole city from, from the view of Chancellor. Um, so I guess what the architecture served to do was show that the city is very diverse in a very small span of square footage. You know, you can get very different vistas from one point to the next and very different interpretations, literary interpretations of the city. Um, you know, from, from Walcott's work, which of course talked about colonialism and sort of escaping that grasp and growing into our own identity. Lovelace's work was the same thing. Um, as well as more, we also featured sort of newer voices that would talk to a new sense of identity, you know? So I think they was kind it, of that a difficult played into each other. thing to do in terms of mixing a blend of old voices and new voices to re represent the same space? No, I don't think it was. I think no, as a well as yeah, go ahead. talk. <laughs> no, as a well as thing, I, I don't think it was a, um, a difficult um, thing to blend. I mean, all of the words reference Port of Spain at, at some um, point in time, um, at different periods of time. So it was just a matter of being able to showcase what inspired the particular writers um, at, at each point in time and how to bring that out visually. Um, when you're translating it from the text to, to, to the visual medium. Um, so I think that that aspect of it is what Janine and I um, discussed the most in terms of how do we show it? How do we present this um, to an audience that they will appreciate that this is coming from, from a book, right? And, and, and keep it interesting visually and, and moving forward. And I think you guys were definitely, definitely successful. Um, so Andil, um, just coming in quickly to you, um, your film features no talking heads at all, just exploring a woman and her process in, in making her art, um, Wendy Anan. Why, why choose that particular um, approach for this film? So one thing is that the intention was to only show the film in a museum oh. setting. So in the space of the, the first place, the piece that she's making is shown is at the Art Museum of the Americas. And the idea was that the piece would be a partner to that. So, you know, at the outset, that was the intention of the film. And then, of course, the pandemic meant that the exhibition was up for an entire year with no one seeing it. And so the film became um, a way in which to experience the exhibition, um, although it will eventually go up. But it was always, you know, my approach, I have a series of pieces in which it's about connecting with the artist's process. And so the, it was really to get out of the way as much as possible, to create something that matched her personality, someone who's notoriously reclusive. You know, I've, I've people have watched this film who have known her for decades said, oh, I, I, I don't know Wendy at all. So it was, it was about keeping that gentle spirit about staying out of her way, making her comfortable with it um, and not directing too much. I mean, one of the things I would have preferred is that uh, we used for, for example, her initial audio, which is, is much more uh, vivacious and interesting to listen to. But Wendy was very insistent that she needed to read exactly what she was going to say after a series of interviews. Um, so it was, you know, it was about, about sort of like reflecting who she was more than anything else. And therefore there was not going to be another narrative voice in there. Okay. All right, um, we're almost out of time. Uh, it's just run by so quickly. 
Um, I want to thank all of the filmmakers for coming and joining us today and giving us a new perspective on their film. Thank you, our audience, for joining the Q&A. Don't forget, you can still catch all these great films if you haven't yet. Um, as they're still screening today, check out ttfilmfestival.com for all the information you need on how to purchase tickets. And when you can, you can, um, we have two more days of the festival. You can check out as many films as you like. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of your time with us. Thank you so much.